On this episode of Creative Mind, we dig a little bit deeper into the mechanics of gameplay, specifically the UI and the UX. This big mystery world that's grown in the last 10 to 15 years as one of the biggest job markets in the digital world of UI UX. And we sit down with Greg Eichholzer, who has helped develop the track here at the Academy and has worked on a lot of games and developed a lot of interfaces and some great tips and tricks to help you develop a good UI UX platform for your game. Some things he wants students to keep in mind are like contrast, repetition, alignment, proximity. And if you figured out the acronym for that, then you're really going to enjoy this podcast. So without further ado, it's Greg Eichholzer. Explain to me how games have changed from Nintendo, Xbox, even Game Boys, how games are now so part of our culture now. Well, I mean, if you think about it, um, how many people do you see on the street now walking around with a smartphone? Everyone has a tiny computer in their pocket ready to play a game at virtually like any time. And they're playing a game And they're virtually. playing a game <laughs> like <laughs> everywhere. Yeah. Right? Um, it's it, it just, it's so much easier to get a game in front of somebody now. When games were Atari, Nintendo, you know, on a kind of locked to a console, um, I think it was just kind of played off as like, oh, that's kid stuff. Right. And you had to, you would rent a game before you even bought it. I mean, it was a big deal. Yeah. It was, it was a hard choice, you know, and parents would have to be there and like kind of, you know, look, look over and see like, what are you getting? Like once you bought a game, that was it. That was the game that you got and you played it until it was, until it was done or you unlocked stuff in the game now it's like anything that used to be like an unlockable thing you just get it <laughs> like you have to buy it you just be all right you like, because you're paying for like, oh. the pleasure you know you used to be able to like unlock big head mode you know like nba jam or something yeah. and and then now it's like oh i gotta buy it <laughs> 99 right. cents right right, right? 90, exactly yeah. 99 cents so like when when microtransactions and that stuff i remember like first encountering some of that with those like social games like Facebook games and early like mobile games like starting to encounter that uh, I felt like that was kind of um, not seen as like a a viable like model I think by a lot of the big uh, big players in the game world and then I think once they started seeing companies making uh, more money than the gross national product of some small countries they were like hmm Wait a minute. We've been giving away all this stuff as part of our games for free. You know, some some somebody was like, "Oh, we can <laughs> we can make some money on this." Right. Wait, we're we're in the wrong. We're we're, we're in the money making business, people, right. not the entertainment. And business. I, I think people forget that too. You know, like going to work in a studio. Yes, everyone there is a creative person and wants to make a creative, like, fun product or fun game or experience, but. You know, at the end of the day, you're still making a product. You know, it's it's art with a purpose. While you may be like an art director or an intern, you're still taking direction from who owns the, the company and the property, and, and they have to turn a profit at the end of the day. Otherwise, there's no company, there's no job, <laughs> right? So, well, well, let's go back because I know sure. that we got so much to go through because I think, you know, what what's your official title now or, or the track you're building here at the sure. Academy? So the track that I'm building, um, I'm the uh, UI UX lead instructor in the School of Game Development. And the track I'm building uh, is specifically for learning what user interface and user experience for games uh, specifically specifically games, games. Okay. what what that means and how to how to work within that scope y- ui is user interface right and ux is user experience right okay so they're two separate worlds okay so from my experience that could either be one person or it can be separate people when you see job listings for user interface and user uh, experience, sometimes they clump it together in small studios that make sense because you're going to have to do a lot. Uh, in bigger studios that have the budget for more people, you can split that job up. And I actually feel that's a better 
solution is to have someone that is really awesome at creating the user interface art mm -hmm. as the UI artist, and then have someone else who is all about user experience that's creating how things should flow, how interactions should function. Um, it's, it's a lot for one person to do, and I've, I've done both. Uh, it's, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, because, I mean, the yeah. little I know about it, and it, it's because it seems like, what, last 10 years, it's become a, a real right. job. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's totally a real job, and it's one of the hardest jobs to find people that are really qualified to, to do it. Okay, well, why, why, is, why so? Uh, I think just because there hasn't been, especially in games, there haven't been like a lot of places really specializing or having a, more than a few courses in it specifically for games. And I think that that's something that's going to uh, become more and more important in the next few years. So so you were saying, so UI, UI it's the art, the visual, the creativity side. That's how I view it, yeah. Okay, and then UX is the, the thinky wireframing. Yeah, because user interface, to be really successful as a user interface and user experience person, you have to kind of bridge a few different gaps. You have to understand art and visuals, but you also have to understand some of the technical and um, you know limitations of what a game engine can do or what the type of game you're building is. So you, you have to know uh, a bit about game design. You have to know a little bit of psychology. The, you, the why someone right, does something. Like, like huh, why, is the, why is it that high contrasting values uh, attract someone's attention? Or, you know, why, why is this particular zone on the screen more important than this one? You know, like figuring out how to put someone's attention where you want it, when you want it. So much of my challenge um, when I was in the studio uh, was making sure that people knew what thing to click on and when. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. it, it, right. It, it seems so so simple when you say it, but it's like you are playing a game. It is you're supposed to be interacting with right. this, so it's right. not it's not a passive experience. No, um, something I tell um, the students in my classes too, like. The, sometimes like the best interface is the interface you don't really notice uh, that it's there. Right, which right. can be hard for somebody sometimes. Yeah. You can't uh, see my work, but it works. UI UX is very much a support role, right? Like it's not meant to be really the star of the show, right? Because the, the, the characters and the world and the gameplay itself is the star. But if people don't know where to go and what to do at any given moment, they're going to feel like something's broken, right? So that's that's part of your job as a user experience person and user interface person to make sure that your interface works and only gets the attention of the player when it needs to, right? Like if you think about um, Dead Space. So Dead Space, it incorporates UI directly into like the, the main character model like he's got all these lights going up his back right so in a lot of games you would have a kind of a traditional like uh heads up display right. on the screen that would give you your health and all your right. ammo and all, all that yeah, stuff all my weapons on the left all my right. life on the right right so in this game they did something clever where they put the user interface directly on on the character model so those lights up the spine of the character is actually the life bar it, they they took a lot of things off of the screen and incorporate it more into the game, which was really uh, kind of like fun. And uh, it felt very intuitive. You have to make kind of smart decisions about like how you're going to get people's attention. Right. And that does make sense because if you're playing on a phone, it's, it's in theory a one-handed operation or the, that decision has to be made, whether it's a one-handed game or a two-handed game, right? That also can play into things. Um, so yeah, Dead Space was a console uh, base game, but yeah, like if we're talking about mobile uh, games, the platform, and this is true for like anything, like uh, if it's a PC or console game, uh, the platform is part of the user experience, right? So you have to consider what the player is using, 
you know, if, if they're using a controller or if they're using a keyboard and mouse mm -hmm. or, you know, are they playing sitting on a couch 15 feet away from the television screen uh -huh. or are they playing on a mobile device with the, the screen like three inches from their face? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. So you got to like, you got to think about like where and, and where are they? Especially with mobile games, you have to think about where is your player? Right, like that's all part of the user experience because um, you'll notice a lot of mobile games have about uh, a three-minute kind of playtime limit level. Like that's yeah. it. It's three, like three it's minutes. About and you're three done. minutes okay. because you're trying to capture an audience that's probably on a bus or traveling. You know, maybe they're a passenger in the car. He shouldn't be playing it if you're driving. You know. Right. Uh, <laughs> But of think, course, the bathroom, we're going to say it. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The bathroom, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, uh, try not to sit for more than 15 minutes, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> so, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's really um, interesting, like some of those problems that you, you have to like think about as a user experience person. Well, let's say the company you're working for wants to capture that audience while they're on the bus you wouldn't want to design the gameplay to be like an epic like you need to spend 30 minutes before you can save or before a round finishes right, right. because they'll never progress and uh and you'll never finish and you'll never finish you the, it. it'll be frustrating so like you make the gameplay round very short and exciting for about three minutes and uh make sure that you can play it with one hand because you know if you're on the bus, you're, you're you got, kind of holding, yeah, on you're to holding on to the bar, yeah. you're like crammed into somebody else's armpit, you know. You're, in, you're always in headphones. Yeah, you got your headphones on, you know, and you've got like one one hand free to play the game. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a bizarre sense of bizarre challenge <laughs> when you're creating, especially, you know, you know, it's an art school and a lot of people, like you said, you start, like you started as an artist, you know, you're thinking, well, someone's going to stand back and look at it longingly and, and, and view it and think about it and, mm -hmm. and wonder at all the creative thought process I have. And in reality, it's like one eye, one thumb, kind of paying attention, yeah. just jumping over things. Yep. And, and if it doesn't feel right, then it's going to feel broken and awful and you're going to lose that user. So it's like, <laughs> so it's like as important as all the art and the game design and core mechanics of a game, like whether it's a run and jump or uh, a D dodge and duck. Yeah, and what were you, were you calling it? A strip box or a, a strip? Oh, Skinner, Skinner, Skinner box. box. Yeah, so yeah, Skinner box being that, you know, push a button, get a reward. So any of those basic mechanics, if the user interface impedes the understanding or enjoyment of that mechanic, the game is just going to feel broken. While UI is not the star of the show, it can certainly destroy the show if it's not if it's not <laughs> so working that's, right. So that's that's a weird dichotomy. So you're saying UX is not the star, but it you use the experience is super important. It's super important. And the interface, which relies heavily on the star of the show, can kill it. So let let's put it this way. Um if you're at a concert mm -hmm. and you know you're watching the stage and the show is great but then you're hearing like like static coming from the speakers or like you know lights are flipping on and off and you see the the little um mixing guy going nuts and the yeah. console's on fire then <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> the music wasn't that good cuz yeah. you don't remember the music yeah you don't remember the right. music because you're distracted by all the other things that are taking your attention away so yeah the music you know you're not going to remember the music if you know, you can't, you, you remember everything that went wrong, yeah. no matter who was playing. Yeah. What were you studying before you got into UI UX and what, what was your original career path? So, um, coming out of high school, uh, like in the, <laughs> in the year 2000, seems so long ago, so long ago, it was the future past. Uh, <laughs> you know, that was, um, let's see. So my undergraduate, I, I have a associates in graphic design and a BFA in visual communication. A lot of uh, graphic and print and um, uh, web design, because there wasn't really like uh, like a web design degree, uh, I think, at the time when, 
when right, right, that that's, so that's what yeah 2000 that's web one web, web kind of why 2.0 ish 2.0 was on the horizon yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> so it was, you had to study web or you weren't going to work right so like i okay to put it into perspective uh when i was learning typography um i started learning typography all by hand with pen and ink and learning how to create letter forms by hand and then like the second half of that semester we went upstairs and started doing the on uh with quark express you, you might remember that <laughs> oh, yeah. software so that's you know for anyone that doesn't know what quark express is it's what adobe indesign oh, is now right. which is like setting up documents for print and then once i was like wait a second you mean i can just go and find the font that i want and then type it in here and i just spent all that time learning how to well okay <laughs> no but i think i think Actually learning how to do that by hand gave me a better appreciation and made me remember a lot more yeah. about it. <laughs> but but still, it is like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm old enough to have been in a dark room and printing, mm. but now it's kind of makes me sound like the old granddad when I tell people, <laughs> yeah, but you don't know what dodge and burn really means. Yeah. It's, I just push the button and that's what it does now. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yes, you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, so that path uh you know led me i i I originally thought like in high school because i really i took like every art class i could possibly like take in high school and i remember i had some of the most fun that i had with an art project in high school making a board game like i developed all the rules and made the board you know and all this stuff and that was a lot of fun um because i took like the high school i went to had like some commercial art classes and um i always loved drawing and I thought, well, okay, maybe graphic design is a way to make a living and still draw. I went down that path, and then uh, from there, with my graphic design and visual communications, I ended up uh, working my way toward being a webmaster, and I managed to... Okay, I'm, I'm going I, I'm to interrupt you again. What on earth is a webmaster? <laughs> I, 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 I've had friends that have done this and I, I, ha- yeah. I, 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 like many people, we've had our own yeah. website and if we're yeah. old enough, we had to be a webmaster, but what does a web <laughs> master do? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's one of the coolest titles I probably have had. <laughs> you have to say it with some gravitas and yeah. get real. I'm a webmaster. Webmaster. Yeah. So, um, really what that means is, uh, I, Designed the look and feel of web pages, and I was also in charge of about 25 different people across the campus uh, to make sure if they were submitting changes to the website text that it would come in and come through me, and I would hit so the full approve button. Project yeah, management. yeah, like kind of, kind of like project management, but also developer. They didn't really, at that time, uh, I don't think people really classify, like there weren't the clear classifications of web developer versus content creator versus whatever. So they just said, oh, you're the webmaster. It's like I was doing some like 100 hour practically like work weeks and I was just like, yeah, I think I, I want to draw more, you know, and, and that's when I started um, looking for for grad schools and and for grad school you came to the academy yeah, or I okay I started in the uh, animation uh, on the animation path uh, as 3D and then I felt like I was wrestling a lot with with the 3D software mm-hmm. and really what I wanted to do was was just draw like I, I just found that I loved um, drawing and designing characters and you know animating them like by like 2D more than than modeling and rigging and okay. all that stuff to kind of swing this back to UI UX uh, <laughs> like I I studied animation and then I I started getting like internships and you know doing that and then they discovered that I knew mm-hmm. web and uh, graphic design and combined that with like what I had been learning in 2D animation you know it just kind of married really well into yeah. being a game UI UX person because like I could do the visual effects and visual rewarding like things that they needed for some of those experiences and also I had enough technical knowledge from doing web 
uh, like HTML and PHP and all that stuff that I could actually talk to the engineers, mm -hmm. which is also really important if you're going to be doing user interface and user experiences, having a understanding of how things work. Right. And uh, that just kind of <laughs> made me like this, this right mix the, of... The unicorn that yeah, everybody like needed. Yeah, like this, this mix of like technical and artistic... Um, you know, to, to build these interfaces, um, for the games. Uh, I think one of, one, I can't remember which coworker, uh, somebody that I worked with, they, they called me the Swiss army knife, you know, person on the, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I always thought that was kind of, kind of fun. That's actually, but that, I mean, that's a good way of kind of looking at a, at a career path that there's a lot, especially for something like gaming and, and these, strictly computer creation based art forms is your your it's 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 computers and software and game engines and this artistic sensibility yeah you you have to have yeah you have to have the artistic sensibility you have to understand how the thing works so that you know what you're what you're building and sometimes like i i would go back to paper when <laughs> when like i was really like under pressure to finish something Okay. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, so while the computer is great at streamlining a lot of things, it also uh, comes with that uh, control Z twitch. <laughs> so like, you know, you'll be like drawing something and control Z, right. control Z, control Z, you know, and I, I would just find that if I just stepped away from the computer, went to piece of paper, drew out a whole bunch of stuff and didn't have that control Z twitch happening, I would come to a solution like a little bit faster. That makes sense. I mean, that's that's a great way of looking at it, that that pen and ink and pencil and paper is is getting that idea literally down on paper and it's out. Good, bad, or ugly, it's there. It, it, yeah, and it's when you're solving a lot of like complicated uh, user flow or uh, focus or, you know, screen layout, any, any, you know, grouping information together. It's, I find it, it's often just way faster to just sketch it out really quick and then look at it on the screen later. Like it just, it takes away a lot of your, yeah, like your second guessing. So you didn't go straight into UX or UI. You, you were, while you were doing your MFA, you started working in game design or or animation the first place that i was um brought into for an internship um it was an animation internship okay so like i did a lot of animation for um uh, social games on facebook which uh, still uh, a, a new concept that never existed 10 yeah years ago. i think i i kind of um it was almost like i was at the right place in the right time mm -hmm. and i think my part of my background I also worked before I was a webmaster. I also worked at a small animation studio in Syracuse, New York. I I learned and self-taught a lot of Flash uh, animation, which is now Adobe Animate. I knew that software really well, you know. And also as a webmaster, I had to <laughs> I still had to use it. And then I got hired uh, to do animation for um, uh, for a game called uh, Ravenwood Fair. Uh, it was like all like cute little animals and stuff like you're building a little fair and you have to keep the trees from overgrowing like you're, <laughs> you know, so you had to go back every day and chop trees down. Right. Otherwise the, the, the whole Farmville-esque yeah. idea. Yeah. Something's always coming after you. Yeah. Yeah. So something like that. And then, and then from there I got another internship, uh, at Kabam, uh, and I was brought on to do animation, but then that project, um, I think wasn't doing as well or whatever that they wanted. So they pulled me off of that and put me onto um, a brand new thing called Godfather Five Families. I was like the one of the first interns on that. So I was like making any kind of whatever art and placeholder stuff until they built up the rest of the team. And then they figured out, like I knew what I was doing with graphic design and, and, that, and they're like, <laughs> oh, we know what to do with you. Here, come over here, and you're gonna sit here and you know make make screens for the next uh, four and a half years. You know, so I, I kind of did that. Uh, it taught me a lot. I worked with a lot of really amazing um, artists and and people while I was there. 
Well, I mean that. I mean that's the, kind of the best education. Yeah. It sounds like you're just yeah. con- just doing everything. Well, like if you think about it, um, fi- we get 15 weeks in a in a class, right? And like three hours. Uh, so you get about uh, 40 hours. Like you get like what yeah. is equivalent of one work week over a semester. Wow. You know, yeah. with you know, if you think about actual yeah. in in class time, right? So like focusing on okay. so your growth in at a job is going to be exponential uh, compared to class time. Well, I, I mean, mean, okay, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's not counting like homework and sure. and all that, but... But that makes what those those internships all that more... Internships are important. very valuable. Um, one, because you're getting to practice a lot of those um, really uh, important other skills that, that make you hireable, which mm-hmm. is like, how do I put it? Like, if you want to work, don't be a jerk. Yeah, <laughs> you no, know, like... I mean, I, I mean, a lot of people have talked, and that's yeah. the you know, you're spending, like you like you said, you know, school. You spend forty hours a week with these pre- people. Right. I mean, I spend probably more time with right. my colleagues than I do my own family some right. weeks. It's true. Yeah. So you know, you you have to conduct yourself in you know respectful you know way. You have to make sure you know be on time, communicate everything, and uh, it's. You know, those those skills are by and far, I think, like more important than than any technical knowledge because software always changes and, uh, you know, game engines are going to change. But the things that aren't going to change are like interpersonal skills, <laughs> communication <laughs> right. skills uh, and those core art and design skills, having uh, keeping your your mind kind of like open to learning new things and that's i feel like out of anywhere that i've i've worked that's been the most important thing is like always be ready to learn you know like because there's always going to be new stuff and then you're also at the same time you're learning you're also teaching because you were telling me you know before we started that you were you were doing localization which is another one of those right. new so when i was working on uh games like godfather's five five families dragons of atlantis and you know the mobile games like dark district and uh marvel united and all this stuff like it was really important that when i was designing the interface that i kept in mind that this was not just going to be in english it was going to be in english french italian german spanish and then, you know, uh, all other, like, Cyrillic languages that have way different, like, or more characters in their Right, alphabet. right. It makes, yeah, that's that, you know, I know German and, and Cyrillic, it's all these different characters, yeah. let alone how much longer the yeah. word is. So it's like, um, when I was at, at Kabam, like, uh, one of my favorite translations that came back in German, uh, I had designed this, this little, this little ad that goes in the game, and it was for, like, a... Uh, thing called a training whistle bundle and the text was stacked on top of itself but the german translation came back and it was like thriller fife and packet you know and it was all one word <laughs> like there were no spaces i was like what am i gonna do right, with this yeah you can't break like, that up. <laughs> like, so i had to design like a special ad just for the german translation oh, because right. the german translation would always come in it was either like uh 40 or 60 percent longer or it was like shorter in one word. Oh man! <laughs> so, it like, so it was like mostly it was longer. You had to like keep in mind that it was going to be different. In uh, my game 190 class, the mobile UI UX class, you know, sometimes I, I get people they'll hand letter some stuff like you know for like paid like screen titles or like a logo or something, like that. and I have to remind them like, ah, oh, hey, that looks cool. Uh, now. What if I ask you to put that in French and German and yeah, right. and they're like, oh, <laughs> yes. yeah, let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> Everything you're doing is great, but I'm going to ruin it for you. Well, it's more like you're in the studio. You will have to do that five or six times. Yeah, localization is. I mean, that's it, that's key. Yeah, uh, it you know, and it depends um, on the studio size too. Like if it's. Um, you know, if you're working with a larger group, maybe you'll have a, t- a team that only, you know, does like localization and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but if you're at a smaller place, which is where I, I feel like most people kind of get a, a start. And this is so common in anything that is 
digital or, or computer based is you're you're dealing with offshore teams and sure. outsourcing as much as you're learning you're training somebody when i was associate art director at uh rock U, i was associate art director on three live games uh, i had a team of artists here and i had a team that i had to communicate with in india some of those days i would be you know do my full day here and then at like 10 o'clock at night i would have to get on uh and do uh like uh, when, when their day starts yeah when their day starts at 10 o'clock at night our time um you know like a zoom meeting or you know mm. whatever and, and i'd video conference with them and go over what you know what are they going to deliver today what kind of feedback do i have for them you have to really think through your feedback you have to be able to, again, it, it comes back to being able to communicate and be a human, <laughs> you know, and, and cause you know, you don't know what everybody's day is like, but you know, you have to still be able to talk about like, okay, what th- these are, this is, this is where your art currently is. Mm-hmm. And this is what the um, bar is set to for this game. It It's, this is where it is. This is where it needs to get to. And I would have to point out like, you know, what things were working and what wasn't working, mm-hmm. um, which really translates a lot into what I, <laughs> what I, what I do here too. Right. So that, that's a lot of, that's, that's the core fundamentals of teaching. It's not yeah. just how to do it. It's, it's why. Well, it's like how, yeah. Why and, and how you deliver the, the feedback too. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I, I feel like, you know, some of the best teachers that I've ever had, you know, not only, you know, was what they were showing us really valuable. It was also the way that they delivered it. They weren't yelling or scolding or, you know, talking down, talking down. It was, it was like very much like, this is what it is. This is why it works. This is how you accomplish it. Right. Like that, like I found that type of, uh, explanation a a lot more, uh, beneficial than like do it this way. My career trajectory, you know, having started as an intern for animation went, into becoming uh, like game artist, UI artist, and then working my way up over the course of five years to uh, associate art director at uh, another company in in the Bay. Like, it's really funny, like all these companies, I worked within like about a four block radius (laughs) of the school. So (laughs) the the game ghetto. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Like it's, it's, and it's all here, you know, and yet again, another reason to be in the Bay area. What was that that push to get you into teaching now at the academy? One of my uh, favorite teachers, uh, Michael Buffington, he he's like, "Hey, we have this this UI UX class that needs a teacher at night. You want to come in and interview for the?" I was <laughs> like, "Uh, sure." And so like, I, I just I came by. I I you know saw what what they were doing with the class, and I thought it was really exciting. I did that for like maybe like a year and a and some change before I, I came on full time. It was just, it was a lot of fun. Like it, I felt like I was having more fun in the classroom, working with the students and explaining why we need to do some things like, you know, this way or that way. And, and just like seeing when uh, somebody gets it right. Like that, like when you see that, that light turn on that that was like all the motivation that I needed to keep coming back and and doing this was just to, to see when somebody understood walk me through a UI UX track just like anyone else coming into the the uh, school of game development there's like a core set of classes right so you're going to be learning uh, a little bit about game design you're going to be learning a little bit about um, the game engines and when it splits uh, and people start going into their own directions is it more you're really good at this come with us or is it more of you need to learn this go learn it yeah so like some people come into ui ux uh either as recommended by michael from the concept art track because they've shown an interest in more of like the graphic uh design end of creating things and he'll push them toward toward me um, and then I'll, I'll get people that are in game design that are learning about more about the mechanics and how things work 
that want to learn more about user experience, which I highly recommend. I understand UX and UI a little bit. I think a lot of people do when you start explaining it, but they look at it as how a remote works. When I say something like core mechanic, right, like a core mechanic of a game, if it's running and jumping, that's really the core user experience. That's what the, the user is doing. Do, and that's the behavior that you want is them to run and jump. A core user experience, a core game mechanic. And there are people that just are fascinated by this. Right, okay. right. Because you, know, you have to build everything else up to support that core mechanic. Like a game like Super Mario, mm. and the whole core mechanic is running and jumping. You run to jump to run from left to right to complete the level, you run and jump on enemies to defeat the enemy, mm -hmm. you run and jump to yeah, hit go, the bricks. Yeah, to hit yeah. the bricks. The user interface is a, a directional pad and yeah. a button that, that facilitate running and jumping. You know, the other interface elements, the visual ones, question marks that blink are drawing your attention to make you want to run and jump at that. The little enemies are coming from the opposite side of the screen to encourage you to run and jump onto the right? right so so everything has to support that that main okay. mechanic okay um you know so in that way anyone that's more of the game design side that maybe maybe art and drawing is not their you know their main focus mm -hmm. maybe they're more interested in how it works and how to get people from point a to b and make that easy to understand and fun right that's <laughs> right. That's that's it's the. Fun. It's supposed to be fun. And that's the trick, right? Got like it. that's yeah. that's the hard part is like making it easy to understand and fun. <laughs> well, I mean that that sounds fascinating because it's basically you're 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 coming up with the concept of how to make people have a good time. How do you make people buy a product? But how do you make people have a good time while they're doing it? Yeah. So yeah. I've uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's not not to, not to pull the air out of the balloon. But. I mean that's a fantastic question, and I think that's one that we could sit here and debate for. And some places that I that I've worked, they were also really fascinated with um, how, in the same regard, like how to build a hit. We're only going to make hit games. You know, like I've heard, I've heard that, you know, phrase, it's a, it's a very admirable goal, right? To say, we're only going to make hit games. I would love to know what the formula is. A lot of time, you know, hit is synonymous with fun. You know, people are, are, you know, is it fun because a lot of people are playing it or is it fun because the actual game is interesting enough to, you know, garner your attention uh, is the mechanic behind it enjoyable, worthy of repeating, right? Like, or is it the art that has drawn you to the game and makes it fun? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of ingredients mm -hmm. to like what could be fun, and you know, fun is different based on who you're thinking of, right? Like, what's fun for someone who's five to eight isn't going to be necessarily as fun to someone who's, uh, you know. 17, 18, and up, how to quantify and measure and, <laughs> you know, discover, like, what is fun for those different groups uh, is all part of part of user experience, too. Like, we would off that we were building to places to be played by random selections of people, uh, you know, uh, user testing. So now, so we've gone from drawing pictures to a whole lot of math and now a whole lot of science yeah. and psychology. All for what somebody like me or somebody older than, than both of us will go, for some stupid video game? Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's incredible the amount of effort and thought and care that has to go into these. Uh, and it's even more important now probably than ever because if you think these, these games that are on the App Store that are in the top grossing, they're making probably more money than we could fit in a, uh, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, bus you terminal. You know, like it, I've, I've heard from other people, a million dollars a day or more is not an more. uncommon number. For those top grossing apps, that's probably considered a failure. A uh, million dollars a day is a failure. Yeah, I mean, because most of, I think like most of what they burn on production for the game, you know, you figure it's got to support all the people that, are building it, but then they're also supporting 
the advertising budget. And that's, I think, where most of it is actually getting spent and burned is on advertising. Because if you can't get enough, uh, what do they, what do they term it? User impressions, right? So like if you don't get enough impressions and you don't get enough click throughs and installs on that, then you're not going to make money. Yeah. And then you right, can't the, the buy end, dinner, you know? So. Yeah. Right. And you were saying like, cause I mean, I've seen on these mobile games that it's, it's, it's very much, it very quickly becomes pay to play. Yeah. That's, that's a tricky one. Um, I never really feel good if the core mechanic of the game is monetized, right? Like if you can't progress in the game without paying, I feel like there's some kind of failure there. Uh, I think the games that have done this uh, well figure out how to monetize things that don't interfere with the gameplay itself, like League of Legends, right? Like they, they... release new content it's available for everyone to play with for a few weeks or whatever right like and then it gets blocked and if you want those characters or that thing or skin or whatever again then you pay for it right Right? that that makes sense to me you know but they also have a huge following right so like smaller studios it's harder to kind of justify that that. yeah the noise yeah so uh and that's another thing like that uh back when like apple and you know the the store was a lot smaller like you could as a smaller developer make a bigger splash because it was new mm-hmm. um you know and now that like the big developers like you know you've got blizzard and you've got bethesda and those guys like making mobile games you know like all making mobile games they have the the backing to really push their product in front of people get bigger audiences on those games faster you know that's great for them you know (laughs) and at what cost well yeah it makes it it makes it harder for for smaller guys to kind of make a big splash uh, unless you get like a feature from apple getting featured by apple makes your game much more visible to everyone with a phone a video game is not a new thing but it's still now that it's mobile and 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 even non-mobile, the 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 user experience and the user um, interfaces is... it's definitely matured with the audience, you know, and the and the industry itself is matured, you know, the, the industry, money wise, makes more a year than the movie industry. Every time I hear that, yeah, that's insane. Especially like when you've got you know movies making a billion dollars at box office, but games it's like. Oh, yeah, what, you know, right. whatever, yeah. you know, and we did that last game? week, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> and then, and then the movies have the game attached to it too. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> and so, and some of these games are super simple when you, I mean, Farmville, I mean, I say Farmville just cause it was in the lexicon for a long time. I mean, it's a game, but it's like, uh, that's enjoyable. You click on Question it. Mark? <laughs> you know. Well, right. uh, and then there's like a whole other set of games now too, like clicker games. Like idle idle games, like okay. there's this whole like genre of games where you just set up a couple of things and let it run. It was really funny. Like some of the games I I worked on that were um, web based games, uh, it, it, we would see spikes in like activity and things like on the uh, game servers and that uh-huh. like during what would be like lunchtime hours and things <laughs> right, like that. You know, right. and it, <laughs> it was really funny. Like how you could like watch like behave like patterns of behavior and right. like things which like i'm that. sure is really where it all comes down to is where where the value of all this comes to anyways you know behavioral targeting and yeah and, yeah like knowing who your user is your you know user or player mm-hmm. right um knowing who they are knowing what they want to do and what they want to get out of it anytime the game is social and uh requires you to interact with with others uh there becomes like this social pressure that like oh i have to i have to play right. because so and so is you know waiting for me to do this so that i can you know do this and it's like so that kind of keeps community yeah, building yeah like the community building like that keeps people like engaged right that would be called like an engagement feature having social features in the game becomes an engagement thing and then there's you know daily login and it's like oh well that's that's a another type of engagement and retention feature like we want to make sure people are logging in and 
checking off like, hey, I logged in three times this week. I earned this other bonus. That's another little mechanic to keep people, you know, playing. Is that what we're teaching here or is that part of the overall? I definitely talk about it okay. in the mobile uh, UI UX class because you, when when I went into studio, I didn't know any uh, much about any of that, like how those features were built into the, the games and why and all that. So I, I make sure that I talk about it. My students will know about it before they get out of here because um, it's important you, you know, knowing like, like what a retention feature is, what a engagement, what a, mm-hmm. you know, point of sale and this, you know, like all these important terms around uh, business and interface that has to get somehow made fun <laughs> right. in the game. <laughs> I'm enjoying spending my money. It's amazing. Yeah, this you is think- great. I feel amazing. You took my money. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, I get to buy dinner again. Hooray. You know, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> yeah, we got to make that sound fun. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's, de- it's definitely fun. So it, it's problem solving, entertainment, business, and then teaching your user and yeah. yourself is what UX UI learning is. Kind of, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's, that's, a, that's a fair definition, I think. <laughs> like the willingness to observe how other people interact with things is is really important, right? Like I know where I put the start button. I hand it to 10 other people. Where's the start button? You know, like I, <laughs> you think, well, it's it's the biggest button on the screen. Why? What, what do you mean you don't know where it is? You never You never really know until you get people to look at it. If it's working the way that you think it should should work. Or is it working for the audience I'm trying to, to you know, have use it, right? Okay. So, I mean, what are you looking for and what are some skills people need to start, you know, if they're really into it, what skills should they start developing or, or right. people start noticing that are going to be viable and valuable? Uh, design, like graphic design, super important. Now, why, why graphic design? I, I, I'm, I've heard a lot of people say this lately and, and graphic design – is is to me is one of those kind of mystery visual design things because it's it's a lot of things but it can be it's so simple sometimes that it freaks people out. Well, often the most simple seeming things are the hardest <laughs> to to, to uh, kind of create, right? Like boiling something down to its bare essentials, right? It's graphic design, it, making something easy to read and uh, visually pleasing, very difficult. Right, so uh, having an understanding of graphic design principles and the the particular ones that I care about the most as a user experience and user interface artist, uh, you can remember it really easily if you remember the word crap. Yeah, I know it's funny. Right? <laughs> You'll remember it. <laughs> so crap design, contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. Oh, so it's good. <laughs> yeah, no, no, crap is great. Crap is great. Got it. So what is what is that again? Contrast. Repetition, alignment, and proximity. Contrast is super important because people are going to naturally look at whatever has the most visual contrast. That's what is going to draw their eye the most, right? Uh, Alignment. Alignment and proximity, lining up information and visuals in columns or in a grid or making that helps with the visual pleasing aspect, right? And organization. To make interface things have to be organized. That's another thing that's really important is being organized. Uh, so that means like naming stuff, being consistent with names. Because you're, you're not alone. You have to like hand this stuff off to other people. It's not version final dot final final for real final client approval final dot JPEG you're, V2. You're raising my anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that is, I've, I've seen that a lot actually. Uh, and that like, Uh, anyway so alignment and proximity uh proximity is important because like if if i think about how the screen is being used and if it's a mobile screen um i think about where the person's like uh hands are going to be when they're using it and i tend to put information that's important and needs to be interacted with 
closer to where their thumbs are going to be and at the lower end of the screen because that's physically closer to the player. It just makes sense to me that way. Yeah. Repetition makes things feel more reliable because you're not changing the visual language over and over. You're teaching the player a set of visual language and visual cues of like, oh, a green button is always going to be um, a hard currency, real money purchase button. You know, the the blue button is going to be soft currency. That's always going to be a soft currency purchase or something, right? right? Like you're, you're building a set, you know, a visual language and you're teaching them without verbally saying anything just by contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. The other uh, skill set I, I, I talk about is for user experience skill set, uh, I have them remember it by remembering the word paper. So we put crap on, on paper. Uh, and that's, um, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> There's a P. Uh, yeah, P. Uh, yeah, purpose, association, uh, presentation, empathy, and reliability. It's interesting, em- empathy. Empathy also, a lot of people we're talking to, empathy really seems to be a big component of all of, uh, of this. Being able to step outside of yourself and put yourself in someone else's place um, is very important if you're trying to build a user experience. You have to try to understand like what's important to that audience. Do they, you know, is, is the audience uh, capable of reading yet? You know, like, right. do they have a full command of the, of the language? And, you know, like, do they understand all that stuff yet? You know, if not, then you have to think, well, okay, then I need to make my interface full of more symbols and bright colors. And yeah, like you have to think, have empathy, you know, be able to think outside yourself. Purpose, uh, whenever you're tackling a user experience problem, you have to think about, well, what is the purpose of this screen? Why is the player on this inventory screen? Okay. Why do they, you know, what do they want to do here? Is the main purpose of the screen to just sort and uh, equip gear to my character, okay. right? Like, or is the purpose of the screen really to um, encourage the player to get better gear? You right. know, like, you have to kind of think, like, there's going to be multiple <laughs> sets of purposes depending sure. on who you talk to, right. right? If you talk to the game designer, it's going to be like, oh, well, the purpose is for them to equip the right gear to kill that right enemy. And you talk to the uh, the product person, they're going to be like, well, they should see, uh, you know, that their gear is not the best yet and that they need to buy this other thing. You know, so like, and B and the BD team is like, no, 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 the big button that says buy now, buy yeah, now, yeah. right now, buy now. Yeah, so you have to kind of play a um, a balancing role, and I always try to th- put myself in the place of the player and figure out like, okay, if I were playing this and I was, you know, uh, ten years old, like what <laughs> uh, would I get? <laughs> like, what's happening here? You know, and and I'm never, you know, the solutions that I come up with, uh, I can't say like for sure, like, oh yeah, that's for sure. You know, every every ten every ten year old is gonna course. get get that, and that's where analyzing and getting it out in front of real people is really important to user experience uh, and developing that stuff. Uh, you know, actually getting real data back, incorporating that. So you have you have to have that. Okay, so we had the P yep. and the A. Purpose, association. So association works with uh, both proximity and alignment from the design side, right? So association, I try to teach people like, okay, I've got 1920 by 1080 amount of pixels to work with. Which section of this screen are we always going to associate with your character Where and your the stats? The map is always in the top left corner, right. the actions over here, and, and so forth, okay. Right. So I, I also call that like uh, information map. You know, like I, I'll always try to keep things that require the player's attention, you know, most like quest goals or, you know, who, whatever, like whatever that thing is that you want the player to be doing should always appear in the same place. Right. Like you want them to get 
used to saying like, okay, I don't know what I'm doing right now, but if I look in this top left corner, I'm going to see what my objective is, right? Like you don't want that like showing up any old place yeah. all the time. You want people to learn that that's where they look, right? So I try to, with that, that thought of association, start associating like things like placement on the screen with particular aspect of the game, like your character, the enemy stat, quest objective, mm -hmm. uh, where am I, you know, like that, that kind of thing. Things are where you would expect them and they don't change. Um, other associations, like we, we talked about, like associating particular colors with particular interactions, mm -hmm. okay. right? Um, associating shape with different meanings, right? That's also really important. Like anything that's a button always has rounded corners. Anything that's a framing element has sharp corners. Everybody knows what a link on a website looks like. It's blue. Oh, it's that blue thing, yeah. that, that really ugly blue color. <laughs> that, yeah, so, yeah, like, it, it, and that's another thing, like, association's important with is associating things to information people already understand, right? Like, you have to leverage a lot of what people already know. Western world, you know, it's like uh, green is go, red is stop, you know, like, so you can always use that kind of information to, to help your player. What, and what's the second P? Purpose, association, presentation. So that's another thing that's very, relies very heavily on our crap design principles, mm -hmm. right? You know, how you present the information, right? Like choosing when something pops up on the screen, right? Like to get someone's attention, where it's placed on the screen, how much contrast it has. It all like changes how important that is because at any particular moment, in the game, like, I feel like players should know what their objective is. They should know all the, the things that they, they need to know about their character's stats without having to dig too much or think too hard, right? Like, um, something that always kind of, like, bother me is if, if uh, uh, games are trying to teach you how to play and it's just, like, a little arrow... Like pointing, <laughs> click this button, click this button, yeah. click this button. That's good at like getting people to look at like the interface elements, but really all you're teaching the player is, oh, click on the thing it's telling me to click on, right? You're like, you're not really teaching them. It's not an experience. Yeah. So I would, I would like, you know, get through games like, like that, like click through, uh, yep, click, 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 click. And then I'm left with no arrow to tell me what to do. And I'm like, <gasps> now what do I do? Yeah. You know, and, and, <laughs> and it's not fun. Yeah, like my my preferred method of kind of teaching the player is um, teaching them what they need to know when they need to know it. Uh, say, you know, you've just launched a new game on your phone and it you're looking at all the interface, you're like, oh, what does this do? And you tap it and then it gives you a bit of information. It's like, a, oh, like a, almost a reward system. Yeah. So you're rewarding the player for actually interacting with the thing rather than like saying, do this, right? So that's all, you know, part of presentation and also how it's like laid out and, you know, making sure that your fonts are legible. <laughs> you you, you know. can read it. Yeah. It. Like <laughs> typically no more than two fonts, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, like a, a header and a, a body copy. You know, you get much more than that it becomes like like a little overwhelming. It's so funny when you know, with all those old school, you know, fundamental things. It's like, yeah, it, it, you're learning them for a reason. Sure. It, it doesn't change no matter how much money's behind it. Yeah. Uh, so, and E was empathy. Yep. And R is uh, reliability. And reliability is again built on those graphic design principles, right? Like repetition, uh, especially like when we're talking about repetition, and you use those same kind of like color language and shape language and things over again that that reinforces how things should work and that becomes reliability so i always tell my students put crap on paper <laughs> you want to make good <laughs> user interface put crap on paper <laughs> so uh that, you know everybody chuckles and laughs but but hopefully it sticks well i think that's perfect i think that's where we should stop because right. we should put our crap on paper <laughs> But that's perfect. So when somebody wants to learn how to be UX and do, how, how to do UX and UI, that's when they need to really invest sure. in, in coming into this because this, is, this, is, this is, seems to be the future of things. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to go away, you know, uh, as long as we're making interactive things. Um, it's only going to get 
different. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's given you some really good insight into what goes into making a game and how if you're not a designer, if you're not a character developer, if you're not a concept artist, there's still a lot for you to do in the world of gaming if you are not the pen and pencil creative. You can work on the UI UX, you can work on the theory, the gameplay. So if you've dreamed about a career in game development or any kind of career in art and design, then you'll want to check out academyart.edu slash creative mind. Because as more and more art and design career opportunities arise, employers are on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals. At Academy of Art University, you will get the work-ready skills that employers want. You can study on-site in downtown San Francisco or anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request info of our 40-plus areas of study in art and design, including game development, fashion design, photography, UX design, just, again, visit our website at academyart.edu slash creativemind. And starting next month, we're going to dive deeper into the world of Hollywood and filmmaking. We've got some great guests, including Doug Campbell, who's directed 20-plus movies. We've got some great Oscar winners who come on, some producers from Project Greenlight, some highly skilled documentary filmmakers. It's going to be a really good month of podcasts because now you're probably sitting at home like the rest of us. You should be working on that film script. And by listening to our upcoming guests, you'll have some more insight into make that script filmable or how to pitch it or how to develop it into a real movie. So again, as always, if you like what you hear, hit the subscribe button in whatever format you're listening to to listen to more of Creative Mind.